Greetings and salutations, my dear audience. This is Joe St. Egg Benedictus doing a book slash Bible review of this brand new translation that came out uh, about a year and a half ago. The Hebrew Bible translation and commentary by Robert Alter. As I mentioned, it came out not too uh, long ago. It is a one person translation by Robert Alter, who is the professor of Semitic languages in Berkeley, California, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, I wanted to get my hands on this thing for a long time. I remember when it came out, I read the reviews on it and I thought, man, I wanted that for Christmas. Actually, it might have just been this past year because uh, I really wanted it for Christmas. Then my friend got a hold of me recently and said, hey, do you know anything about this Hebrew Bible? And I said, yeah. And uh, she said, well, I was going to get it. And then I looked online and it was about half the price. It was about 60 bucks, down from about 120 bucks. Three different books, the uh, Torah, the Prophets, and the Writings, and uh, very happy about that. So snagged it, ordered it, got it. You know me, I usually don't do new uh, books or Bibles, but this I could not refuse and wanted to show you a uh, little bit about it. So first thing to note is, of course, the beautiful book uh, case. And each particular book also has beautiful cover art, as you can see. I like cover art. Yes, he does like cover art. That's a shout out to my pal Mike in the background, and also the visionaries and mystics out there. Thank you for joining me. Got Mike in the background these days, just hanging out, hanging with the egg Benedictus. So each of these books uh, deals with, uh, obviously, the three sections of uh, the Hebrew Bible, and uh, each one of these uh, has the same uh, introduction page and introduction essay. So two things I'm going to talk about today. One, I'm going to show you what it looks like on the inside, and the second thing I'm going to talk about is the introduction by Robert Alter, because it is amazing to give you a little bit of philosophy on how he translates it. First, let's jump into the to the book here. Okay, I'm going to move this around, grab this, put this here, move this over here, move this over here, and that there, and then I'm going to put this in here. I'm going to get a little seasick, don't mind me, and there we go. Perfect. All right. Okay. So, <clears throat> let's go ahead and kind of flip through some of the introduction pages, show you what the volume looks like what the text block looks like. Long, long life of Robert Alter. Long career led to the making of this Hebrew Bible. Um, translated right from the Hebrew, uh, again, with commentary by Norton and company. Okay. You can see 2019. So, yeah, let's see. That's two years ago. Time flies when COVID hits. First edition here. Okay. It gives you about the author, and, and all three volumes does this. It gives you the contents of the particular volume, but the introduction to the Hebrew Bible is the same, and then it gives you introduction to the different parts. This is introduction to the five books of Moses, so the other one is introduction to the writing, so on and so forth. Um, the introduction to the Hebrew Bible is in several parts. The first part is the Bible in English and the heresy of explanation. I'm going to explain that to you in a few minutes because... I think this is where the real gold is, is the introduction. I've been reading it, and it's been almost, um, it's been a spiritual experience. It's been incredible. But we'll skip that for now and go right to the text. Jumps right into chapter one, single column, with the verses on the side, and then you have your, your text and your comments. So... Just to give you an example, when God began to create heaven and earth, and the earth was then was welter and waste and darkness over the deep. So you think, welter and waste? What, what in the world is that? So you go to welter and waste. The Hebrew tohu wabahu occurs only here and in two later biblical texts that are clearly alluding to this one. The second word of the pair looks like a, uh, a nonce term coined to rhyme with the first to reinforce it. In effect, I've tried to approximate the English by alliteration. Tohu by itself means emptiness or futility. And in some contexts, is associated with the trackless vacancy of the desert. Okay? So there you have it. Again, single column. You have the book, chapter and verse on the top, page number, and then commentary. 
One of the things that, um, I'll go to the back here. In the front, I believe there is a map in the front. I'm trying to think, where is that thing? I think each one has a has a Hebrew map. I don't see it right. Oh, there it is. So there's the acknowledgments and then the map. There's one map. I'm not sure if the maps are different in each one. I haven't looked at that, but everything else is the same. Uh, it talks about Robert Alter, and then about the artwork on the back. Okay. All right. So one of the things that I really love about the, I haven't read this text, by the way. I just got this yesterday, so it's not like I read through the Bible. I plan to read through this uh, soon. Um, as you know, it takes me time to read through the Bible. People do it in a year. It takes me like 10 years to read through the Bible. I don't mind, because to me, reading is a spiritual experience. When I read, I, I feed on the Word. I feast on the Word. I'll uh, point you to the video where I talk about reading the Bible in 10 years. But the point of it is, I'll get to this, but I haven't read it. But I did start this introduction. And one of the things that really struck me about it is uh, two things. One, he says that Hebrew is a visual language. So it intends to give you pictures, not necessarily to be read to explain something. So what he talks about, for instance, he'll say, when it talks, the Bible talks about Abraham's seed. A lot of English translations will say, Abraham's offspring, so they'll translate the word seed for offspring. He said that's not really accurate because seed is, yes, offspring, but it sets up a, a picture or a word picture of a harvest. So, yes, yeah, seed means offspring or progeny, but it also is supposed to evoke in you an image of a harvest or a an agricultural picture. So he said what, what happens is when you take the, English, the, the Hebrew – and you try to translate it into English, if you go from translating seed to offspring, you're explaining the text for its context. And so he talks in the introduction about how Bible, how, how English translations fail in some ways, how English translations fail because they try to explain words rather than just to translate them to give the picture or to present the picture or the vision that the Hebrew language is trying to invoke. Let me read you a section of this, and then I want to uh, read you one, a, f a few more sections just briefly, and then I want to get to the second point, which I think those of you who are King James people or King James only people will really love, uh, or, or at least appreciate. So let me go ahead and read this briefly. Why, after so many English translations, a new translation of the Hebrew Bible... There is, as I shall explain in detail, so something seriously wrong with all the familiar English translations, traditional and recent, of the Hebrew Bible. Broadly speaking, one may say that in the case of the modern versions, the problem is a shaky sense of English, and in the case of the King James, a shaky sense of the Hebrew. The present translation is an experiment in re-presenting the Bible, and above all, biblical narrative prose, in a language that conveys with some precision the semantic nuances in the lively orchestration of literary effects of the Hebrew, and at the same time has stylistic and rhythmic integrity as literary English. I shall presently give a more specific account of the kind of English I have aimed for and of the features of the Hebrew that have prompted my choices. But I think it will be helpful for me to say something first about why English translations of the Bible have been problematic, more problematic, perhaps, than most, pe uh, most readers may realize. It is an old and in some ways unfair cliche to say that translation is always a betrayal, but modern English versions of the Bible provide, unfortunately, persuasive evidence for that uncompromising generalization. Uh, let me go ahead and read another section that caught my attention. The unacknowledged heresy underlying most modern English versions of the Bible is the use of translation as a vehicle for explaining the Bible instead of representing it in another language. And in the most egregious instances, this amounts to explaining away the Bible. Okay. Um, he talks about that a little bit. One more. Modern translators, in their zeal to uncover the meanings of the biblical text for the instruction of a modern readership, frequently lose sight of how the text intimates its meaning. The distinctive, artfully deployed features of ancient Hebrew prose and poetry that are instruments for the articulation of all meaning, message, insight, and vision. Okay, um, And then he gives examples. One of the examples that he gives is, is seed, as I mentioned. 
Um, and he talks about, again, Hebrew being a visual language and how there is not a large word base in the Hebrew. So the beauty of the Hebrew language is they, uh, the, the ancients, uh, the authors, used a very small Hebrew kind of lexicon to give it a rich uh, fluidity that adds to the vision of the biblical text. So try, um, try limiting your, 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 um, your word base and then speaking about God's word from that word base. And he talks about how words are repeated, but nuances and definitions shift based on the story. One of the other things he talks about is the, um, the wa, which is uh, W-A-W, which stands for end. And he talks about how in English, people take out the end because it's repetitive. So here's his translation of the story of Genesis 24. Let me read it. So this is his translation. And she came down to the spring and filled her jug and came back up. And the servant ran toward her and said, pray, let me sip a bit of water from your jug. And she said, drink, my Lord. And she hurried and tipped down her jug on one hand and let him drink. And she let him drink his fill and said, for your camels too, so on and so forth. And she hurried and emptied her jug into the trough, and she ran to get the well uh, to draw water, and and draw drew water for all his camels. In the Revised English Version, which he compares it to, it's, she went to the spring, filled her jug, and came up again. Abraham started to meet her and said, blah, 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 please drink, and at once lowered her jar in her hand and let him drink. When she had finished giving him a drink, she said, so on and so forth. He says that in his translation, the word end appears 22 times, in a new contemporary translation, it appears five times. He says he understands why readers would do that, but it takes out the urgency or the action of the text. And what is the picture? She's working really hard. She's a hero. Because drawing water for camels is not just simply getting water for camels. These camels drink about 25 gallons a day. And she has to feed, I think, somewhere up to like 20 camels. So if you take out all the ends, which moves the action forward, you're missing out on the heroism um, uh, in this text. Um, uh, so here it says, more is at stake here than pleasing sounds for the heroine of the repeated actions is in fact subtly but significantly reduced in all her, in all the rhythmically deficient versions. She, of course, performs roughly the same acts in different versions, politely offering water, so on and so forth. But in the compressions, syntactical reorderings, and stop and start movements of the modernizing version, the encounter at the well and Rebecca's actions are made to seem mat rather matter of fact. However, exemplary her impulse of hospitality. This tends to obscure what the Hebrew highlights, which is that she is doing something quite extraordinary. So that gives you an example of his philosophy. Now, the second point I want to hit on is that he praises the King James Version over and over again for the work that the King James Version and first translating the Hebrew as best the translators could, and retaining some of the rhythm, some of the nuance, and some of the beauty, the visual beauty of the language. So he has high praise for the King James Version. So this is my recommendation to you. If you are into this nerdy stuff like I am, even if you can't get the set, which is about 60 bucks, pick up one of them, pick up one of the books and read the introduction. Uh, if you're a King James Version only uh, kind of person, I think you'll appreciate what he says about the King James, and uh, and it is worth uh, it is worth um, the price of at least one book uh, to read that introduction. So there you have it. Robert Alters, the Hebrew Bible translation with commentary, just came out several years ago. I encourage you to to uh, to check it out if you're a Bible nerd. Otherwise, thank you for joining me. Like, subscribe, and I hope to see you again soon.